Hello there. I'm Steve Balch, the director of the Texas Tech Institute for the Study of Western Civilization, and we are here once more uh, to do our Institute encounters. In this case, our encounter will be with Dr. Uh, William B. Allen. Now, Dr. Allen is here as part of our Institute's commemoration, and it's a week-long commemoration, of the United States Constitution and American civic culture. We've had a series of events, and uh, Dr. Allen's talk, which will be this evening, uh, is the keynote. Um, Dr. Allen is a unusually distinguished visitor. Uh, he has had both important scholarly and public contributions uh, to make to the United States. Uh, his work on the founding, uh, on George Washington, um, and uh, especially among the various books that he has produced. Uh, he's had a number of books on Washington and Washington's role in the founding, and also written a extraordinarily interesting um, new take uh, on Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, on top of that, he has had a variety of administrative capacities, uh, having received his Ph.D. from Claremont McKenna College and having taught at American University and Harvey Mudd College. He went on to be the Dean of the James Madison College at Michigan State, a capacity in which he served for a good many years, uh, and then moved off to a series of public positions, uh, first as a member and then chairman of the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, uh, and then as uh, executive director of the Virginia State Council on Higher Education. So he has not only um, looked at American education from the inside, but uh, has overseen it right, uh, from, from the outside, from, from above, and, and, and so can kind of marry those two perspectives together. Um, greetings. Uh, so Thank glad you so you're... so good to be with you. Glad to have you here with us. Uh, one of the kind of you've written two books on George Washington. I one is a compila compilation of his papers, and the other is a book with the interesting title George Washington, um, the first American progressive. Yeah, George Washington, America's first progressive. America's first progressive. In in what sense was he a progressive? Well, the, the interesting thing, of course, is that he's the first person in American history actually to refer to himself as progressive. And what Washington meant to convey by that was summarized in his general orders to his troops when, for example, he said, we are building a nation which is to become an asylum for the poor and oppressed of every nation and religion. Uh, and that he understood to be a progressive sentiment because it was a way of expressing what he also said in his circular address of 1783, which is that it is the destiny of this country to create a civilization, a political society, in which the amelioration of the human condition could be achieved. So he was a progressive in the sense of expecting the betterment of humankind through the institution of republican institutions, institutions of self-government in the United States. So this is sort of a, an enlightenment concept it yes. is using, yes. uh, based on the political application of the newly conceived of notion of, of human progress, sort of like a la Togo. Pre precisely. In fact, he expressly states at one point, we no longer live in the age of ignorance and superstition. So it was indeed an enlightenment concept from which he expected a continual advance in improving human circumstances. Progressive in that sense. That, that, that made him um, uh, a good deal more prophetic than many of the other founders who would yes. not have seen us sort of on the cusp of some kind of continuous upward movement. Yes, I think that's true. I think he spoke more comprehensively about the country's mm -hmm. future than any other of the founding fathers. He is, in that sense, far more the anchor source for what we take to be the ambitions of the United States. Mm -hmm. um, how is he different from those who use the term progressive today to describe themselves? Well, of course, he used it to describe the results of people taking responsibility for themselves and therefore in defense of the concept of self-government. Whereas from the beginning of the 20th century, the progressives were actually substituting the uh, wisdom of the elite and the experts for the judgment of the people, and hence undermining self-government. So what they call progressive 
is really only a tendency to increase dependence on the state, whereas Washington called progressive the increasing liberal, uh, liberation from dependence on the state of humankind. So they have a kind of technocratic view where we're ushered into the future by a wise elite. Yes. But he thought it we'd uh, we we do it on our own power under our own sails and oars. Huh? He thought so, and he thought so so emphatically that in his first inaugural, he made the express argument that our national happiness was dependent upon private virtue, mm -hmm. not upon public solicitude. Mm -hmm. So if he were around today, uh, what do you, what do you think he would? think about our, our present circumstances and the political impasse to which our politics seems to have arrived? Well, that's a somewhat embarrassing question for me to answer, uh, for the simple reason that I think the things that I say about that I've all learned from George Washington. <laughs> and so it's hard for me to distinguish <laughs> what he yeah. would say from what I am now saying. <laughs> well, then we have he, a right man he, here. He is my teacher. <laughs> In that case, you're, 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 you're the right man to give him voice, so uh, let him... Uh, channel him for us, if you will. So, so, so uh, what I would see, and what I think George Washington would argue, is that we have lost our way because we have ceased to expect from the people themselves the initiative in the efforts to improve their circumstances, and we've substituted the initiative of politics and the state for that. And that that is a crucial weakening of the strength of our institutions. And why do you think that's come about? How uh, have we gone from relying on the virtue of the people to relying on uh, the, uh, the, the, a, a, a bunch of self-appointed saviors who are going to come yeah. along and do it for us? Huh? Well, well, this is largely what I'm going to explain in the address this evening, mm -hmm. but in a summary version of it, I can say this, that we have made a transition from the original conception of freedom to a conception of freedom which is now more strongly founded in supplying people's wants rather than in eliciting from people their exertions. And that's the critical difference. And, and we made that transition practically beginning in the 1930s mm -hmm. and have accelerated it ever since the 1960s, where we treat people as essentially interest constituencies with hands out waiting to be supplied by the government. Now, both our parties have pretty much come around to this view in one way or both another. Both our parties have succumbed to the temptation, the temptation to pander. And the pandering is a form of treating the people as less than they deserve. Might Hamilton have said that this is the result of a kind of mass democracy that we've grown up in the interim between the founding and today? Well, it's certainly true that Hamilton and Washington would have agreed with Hamilton in this. They, they had a very clear and coherent position about this. Namely, that republicanism and the democracy that we enjoy is not meant to be simple majoritarianism. It is not meant to be the direct expression of the majority opinion. It is meant to be the expression of the opinion of the people through elected representatives. So they had an argument which is expressed in the Farewell Address and elsewhere, that once the people have established the government, the voice of the people is the voice of the government. There is not another voice of the people apart from that until the next election comes and they elect a new government. And, and taking that is what fulfills what Alexander Hamilton defined as representative democracy in 1777. He was the first person to use that term in the United States. So for them, it was extremely important to underscore that the democratic procedure for the United States, that is republicanism, consisted in representation and not in the direct expression of popular will. But don't elected politicians, if given the chance, eventually come to the conclusion that the best thing for them is to offer various things to the voters, is to give to the voters what, in Washington's view of the appropriate dispensation, uh, they should be working to get themselves. Well, no, no, no. Let me illustrate this for you in a way that I think is utterly, completely persuasive. There are several occasions in the administration of George Washington where the policies pursued were understood to run contrary to the current of public opinion at the moment, but in which Washington believed, and Hamilton agreed with him in this, that it was the burden of statesmanship not to succumb to the current of public opinion, but to raise the standard. And the most dramatic case in which this occurred was in the Jay Treaty, the treaty with Great Britain that finally put an end to the Revolutionary War and produced a settlement. 
that settlement excluded an extremely important demand which had been consistently made, which was for the return or compensation for slaves. That was not included in the treaty. Washington and Hamilton, delib Hamilton deliberated about it, and Washington, in fact, deputed Hamilton to argue publicly for ratifying the treaty without that, on the grounds that Hamilton ultimately stated that to have included that would have violated norms of religion and morality. Now, obviously, the reason there was such strenuous objection to the treaty emanating mainly from the South was because of the mm -hmm. absence of that provision. But they were determined for moral, principal reasons that it should not be there. And that is the task of statesmanship. Well, yes, and, and of course that generation of statesmen, even mm -hmm. with the flaws that, like other human beings, they had, was uncommon in its understanding of principle yes. and in its character, particularly having been forged through the struggle of the Revolutionary War. But uh, wouldn't have Hamilton been rather unsurprised, and I suspect other of the founders would have also been similarly unsurprised, to see that over time elected officials began to see their career interest in terms of pandering to voters, in terms of giving them things that the government could. They, they certainly observed that mm -hmm. in their own time. Uh, obviously, Hamilton observed that in Aaron Burr. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't speak now just of the duel. That came at mm -hmm. the end of the career, mm -hmm. but at the beginning, his appraisal of Burr was that he was a self-interested panderer, and he understood his own role as being to thwart that. He considered Governor Clinton of New York similarly, mm -hmm. someone who was a bit too flexible in his principles. So, so they saw that in their own time, but they also took it as their task to resist it and to lead the people to resist it so far as they could. Could they do it ultimately successfully? Well, of course, Jefferson's Democrat Party did ultimately overturn the Federalist Party and did instantiate a form of populism, if we want to call it that, not a big government but, form of politics. But it wasn't big government, and even Jefferson and Madison learned, of course, during the administration of the government, that they could not operate the government on the basis of responding to the currents of popular opinion. So in that sense, Hamilton and Washington ultimately prevailed. Now, you'd say that begins to change only with the New Deal, or is there a gradual slide until we go off the cliff? It's a gradual slide. So it mm -hmm. starts, it becomes, of course, emphatic with the New Deal. That's, that's when it reaches its consummation. But it begins in the teens in the 20th century with the advent of progressivism and the arguments and defenses for it. So, so we begin to see that the notion that somehow the office holders alone can give voice to popular needs, popular necessities, and this elite must take a technocratic role in fashioning the outcomes of democracy is also accompanied with treating the public as if they were just a collection of interest. And once we begin to treat the public as a collection of interest groups, we open the door to pandering. So that's when it rushes in wholesale. And in fact, political scientists are sort of well at work at that time. Uh, Arthur Bentley, if I recall, who yes. was sort of reconceiving the political process as a kind of uh, contest among multiple interest groups to get well, their well, share. Thank you. Yeah. You're quite right. Bentley introduces that term pluralism, which became the dominant political science interpretation of American democracy from that time forward, and led to the emergence of such subspecialties as interest group theory mm -hmm. in political science, so, so that we had an entire cultural malformation that emerged in the 20th century, focused in the terms of definition that we find in political science and varied politically through the progressive movement. So in the late 19th century, when people talked about the interests, they were talking about largely as kind of big trusts yes. and things like that that were undermining the commonweal. Yes. Uh, but, but in the 20th century, that discourse shifts and now interest group politics is seen as a normal thing that everybody engages in, everybody has their groups, yes. and it's perfectly appropriate to try to accommodate them. Yes, we in fact made a shift from uh, overthrowing the trust, <laughs> which was of course the great uh, antitrust era legislation, and treating the trust as interest, to building up interest into petty trust. And so we began to build labor unions, and we began to make distinctions based on race and other terms of identity. And all of that moved with uh, 
headlong speed into the 1960s where you didn't have standing unless you belonged to some subgroup. You could not attain political respectability except in the name of some subgroup identity. And at that point we had really disarticulated the whole idea of national union. And lobbyists became a uh, lucrative and, and quite honorable profession for retired politicians yes. rather than these people kind of hanging around outside the House and Senate chambers, uh, again, trying to corrupt the Republic. Yes, that, that's, that's a wonderful observation. There had always been lobbyists, of course, because wherever power concentrates, you're going to attract mosquitoes. Uh, pardon me, lobbyists. <laughs> <laughs> However, it is the case that lobbying changed once we developed this interest group theory, because then it became a professional task to give representation to whatever interest groups could be identified, and that proliferated lobbying on an established and institutional basis. But looking back at, at that phase of our politics, and it seems to me at least that we've gone beyond, to a substantial extent, that phase of mm -hmm. our politics, um, as uh, far as it had drifted from the original conception of a, of a public good and a civic-minded uh, leadership that, that represented the people uh, mm -hmm. through its fidelity to the interests of mm -hmm. the nation, as far as it had drifted from that, uh, it wasn't the kind of the sort of mid-century American politics, uh, wasn't the kind of ideological warfare that we have today. No, that's, that's correct. And um, uh, that's, uh, that seems to me to be a good deal more pernicious and threatening uh, to the stability of our body politic and to our Republican institutions than even sort of interest group politics and old-fashioned lobbying. Um, if you agree with that, uh, how did we get to this new phase of ideological well, combat? I, I do want to agree with that, but with a distinction. Hmm. The, the differences that people fought over in the antebellum era were every bit as trenchant as those over which we fight today, and perhaps even more so for the following reason. When they either defended or attacked slavery prior to the war, they understood themselves to be fighting over the terms of definition of the United States so that they all had a common goal which is to say what America was supposed mm -hmm. to be. The ideological battles are no longer fighting to define the United States. They're fighting to shape our politics in conformity with some idea which may or may not be consistent with the United States as it was designed to be. And so they are as likely to embrace something, let us say, socialism, which has no real reference to the American founding tradition, whatever. And yet it becomes an item in our politics and our ideological division. So, so that our divisions are sharper in the sense that they tend to turn into mutually exclusive arguments where the ends are opposite rather than having a common end and disputing over what is the correct interpretation of that end and the means to secure it. So what would have united North and South prior to the Civil War in terms of their understanding? Well, they could not solve that problem practically because the whole notion of equality stood in the way. But they all understood that. And so you had John C. Calhoun dismissing the idea of equality as a self-evident lie. And you had the Confederacy, of course, adopting a constitution, rejecting it on the same basis. Though so otherwise very much like the United but States. But otherwise exactly the U.S. Constitution. Somewhat weaker, but uh, yeah, yeah, right. Reposing mm -hmm. on consent of the government without the basis of consent, which was equality. So, so there was a lot of confusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but the point, of course, is that the terms of discourse were set. Uh, for us, the terms of discourse are no longer set. Uh, one can introduce really quite radical alternatives independent of anything we recognize as terms of discourse. So that sounds like we've totally lost our intellectual moorings. Yes, that's precisely my sense. What do you think has brought that about? Uh, it, it, several things. Uh, don't you believe certainly that prosperity has been part of it? I'm interviewing you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, think about it. Uh, we, we've been a remarkably successful country with, with great, enormous wealth created. And that means we've placed at people's disposure leisure undreamed of among humankind. And how do they spend those leisure hours? In, in speculative ways, in dreaming of things to do, having nothing to do with what is, of course, the source of this greatness and prosperity. 
which means that there are many opportunities to wander off the reservation. Mm. And one of the things I've always pointed out that is incident to the character of Republican government is it by definition and necessarily carries with it the opportunity for goodwill abandonment. That is because it reposes in the judgment of the people and can only be sustained on the basis of the judgment of the people, it necessarily follows that it can be abandoned by bad judgment. And so, so, so we have an opportunity always there to be distracted, to let our thoughts stray, to lose our focus. And, and that's what we have seen in an era of enormous prosperity. Anything else? Uh, well, of course, there have been interventions in our politics. Mm. Uh, certainly uh, early and mid 20th century saw a real assault against the common principles. Marxism was not simply an abstraction. Marxism attained a degree of practical reality mm -hmm. and produced an international context which was much focused on the United States and influenced people within the United States. And, and that's why we still find socialism among us after the fall of communism in the Soviet Union. Well, I thought you might mention education, though, as one of the reasons well, that we've gone astray. Well, so the role of uh, our educational institutions. Well, well, well this, is, this, is, this is actually this is where I'm headed because. Okay. I'm referring to socialism now for a specific reason. When the Soviet Union fell, when the wall came down, 1989 to 1991, we found ourselves some elements of elite opinion in a moment of rapture, celebrating the final defeat of socialism. And I published at the time a book that contained an essay, that uh, book on the Federalist Papers, the commentary, in which I said, we make a mistake if we think socialism has been defeated. It has only been misliked. The ideas are still there. They will still sow their poison. And now I think I am vindicated in that because we see that, yes, having put the history far enough behind us so that no one can refer to it reflexively, people once again embrace such notions. So why, where do they get them? Why do they embrace them? Because they are cultivated academically. It, it is no longer an independent communist party funded by Moscow that drives the discourse, but it is the remains of all those efforts through the years that continue to penetrate particularly the university world that keeps it alive in the United States. So during the great expansion of American higher education, mm -hmm. again around the middle of the century or after the Second World War, uh, the thought was that um, having more and bigger institutions with more students going through them yes. and a larger professoriate uh, would in fact uh, lead us in the direction of kind of greater understanding um, in which you know the tools of science would be increasingly brought to bear upon social problems of various sorts and we'd have much better understanding about how to solve them. Now it doesn't seem to us at least that it's turned out that way. Um, it certainly uh, was built on a faith of reason, uh, but why didn't, why didn't it do that? You're, you're tempting me to make the observation that some people think building greater septic tanks will create cleaner water. Uh, well, I suppose, guess theoretically at some level that might be well, true. Well, what, what was thought was being created were temples of science, yes, in of which course. people would have a scientific attitude even towards social phenomena. Uh, and that would be part of the great advance of, of mankind. Well, science is not a social practice, it is an intellectual practice. The university is a social institution. You people the university with individuals who perform social roles and functions, which is to say they propagate cultural notions. So who are the people propagating the cultural notions? That is not in itself science. I've, I've been asked this question many times. Uh, if, if the universities aren't really educating, if they're just propagating cultural notions and unfortunately in recent times perverse cultural notions, then where is education taking place? And I always have to remind people, education is not an institutional phenomenon or consequence. And they like to argue about the difference between private and public and I say, no, all education is private. So in any one of these institutional contexts, if you want to find education, you have to find the people who are engaged in conversation which leads them to insight, which leads them to challenge what? Their self-conceptions. Leads them to look beyond their supposed or assumed identities or their received beliefs in order to discover 
what is true, what is real. So that is education. Socratic, in a sense, know it thyself. Is, right? It is Socratic, and, and that is what education is. Well, we cannot define that as what takes place in the universities. It's something quite different. And today, frankly, what's highlighted is reaffirming identity, mm -hmm. not exposing it to challenge, which means that is far from science and far from education. Well, how have we lost sight of what real education should be? What did, why, why did the smartest of our people, you know, or at least many of the smartest of our people, uh, those who decided to make a career within the halls of academia, how did they forget about these Socratic assumptions uh, about the important? Certainly, there's plenty of talk that goes on with respect to kind of critical inquiry uh, and um, whole fields of, of study. Uh, Critical legal theory, um, critical race theory, all sorts of critical things. Yes, yes, yes. So, sure. so you would you would you would think that we'd be getting uh, this kind of um, under the microscope examination, uh, but well, well, you, you, don't, you don't think it turns out that way. No, you, you probably remember better than I do the expression of Maynard Keynes to the effect that the common ideas originate in the rare atmosphere of the universities, typically, or oh, something to that effect. And, and certainly it turns out that we're describing people now who have themselves been brought up on a spare set of ideas, and rather unreflectively, and who have acquired positions in academia, which enables them, gives them the opportunity to propagate those spare ideas, not to investigate. So, so we can begin to see even very intelligent people, or skilled people, let me mm -hmm. say, who can become quite adept at the practice, may nevertheless only be people who are retailing received ideas. And if that's what has populated university administrations and classrooms, then it is no surprise that very little education is taking place there. Is there something that we can do about it? Well, of course, we can always do what always there throughout every human era, and that is those who are thoughtful can persist, even in the context of madness, to raise the questions that explode the madness, and to challenge and to find the receptive souls wherever they be. And of course, in many respects, that's how I've understood my task throughout my career. N not so much to uh, seize control, as to continue to plant seeds of growth wherever there's an open mind to receive the seed. Uh, I don't want to put this too strongly, but, but I have carried out my professional activities much along the lines of the parable of the sower, being aware that sometimes the seed will fall on rocky ground, sometime on dry ground, sometime in fallow ground. But uh, I have to be there when the fallow ground comes along in order to carry out what it is that I'm able to do. But there is no institutional protection for that. There's no institutional protection for goodness itself. There's no institutional protection for virtue. All these things are left to fend for themselves in a free society. And it is indeed one of the arguments in defense of the free society that these things can have beneficial influence only to the extent that they must be left to fend for themselves. So if you look at our university world today, it has over the course of the last half century been very successful in building up all sorts of defenses yes. against the outside. Um, a notion, for example, of shared governance in which when it comes to the content of the curriculum means largely the faculty in their various fields yes. decide. Right. And the notion of, of tenure, uh, which is meant to ensure that once certain um, trial period has come to an end, uh, a faculty member is guaranteed in his or her job mm -hmm. for the rest of their lives. And in the notion of, of academic freedom, which kind of asserts that it is improper for anyone to second guess what a credentialed authority in a particular right. field. You could argue with him, you could do that. Sure. Um, but within the, that domain, domain of his teaching, domain of his writing, uh, mm -hmm. he can come or she can come to whatever decision they want on their right. own. So those are the sort of the three levels of insulation uh, that mm -hmm. have been constructed. 
Um, do you think they were ill-considered? No, I, I do believe that these are levels of insulation, and I do believe that they provide insulation to bad things. But I also believe they provide insulation for good things. And I believe that the power of good over time will prevail over the bad. You know, I, I, I produced a piece in Academic Questions a, a year ago, I guess it was, I can never remember these things anymore, but in which I distinguish for the university context between free speech and academic freedom. And I said that I don't consider the university an arena for free speech claims. I do consider it an arena for academic freedom, freedom of inquiry. And so being able to sustain the defense of free inquiry is extremely important, even though that arena of free inquiry is abused by people who have no inclination to inquire freely. Well, I, I thought that you were going to say that if ideas should fend for themselves, mm -hmm. then in fact all these protections were not only not necessary, perhaps counterproductive, because they uh, sort of seal up uh, ideas in their own little compartments, and they don't have to fend for themselves particularly. I, I have no objection to particular institutions with decided orientation coming into existence mm -hmm. and exacting some degree of discipline mm -hmm. relative to that orientation. That, that's perfectly fine, and that's of course what private institutions may well do. I, I do object to trying to configure public institutions in that way, because it turns out, as we've seen from all the great public institutions that have been created in the United States, that they will not take the opportunity to impose conformity to defend inquiry. They will take the opportunity to impose conformity to limit inquiry. And that, to me, is the greater danger. You mean they won't enforce standards in order to have yes. serious inquiry, yeah. rather they will, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at our biggest, the, the highest scale of political life, you know, the battles that are now going on mm -hmm. between the Trump administration and uh -huh. the Democratic Party, uh, how does what's happened to our intellectual sphere, um, how is that affecting? these bigger battles? Is, 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 are they a reflection of things that have gone wrong at the well, level of education and socialization? So, so does the hashtag resistance movement reflect the failure of our educational system in some way? Uh, I, I have a two-part response to that. I think in part that's true. The sheer ubiquity of resistance on the university campus bespeaks a perverse orientation in the country. And, and I believe it reflects, therefore, the, how far the universities deserve the culture. And so there is this whole pattern of deviation from cultural um, usefulness that ought to be alarming for universities. But something else is going on here at a practical level that I think we shouldn't lose sight of, because uh, we, have, as a people, we are in the grip of a calculated assault on our institutions. Uh, what I've labeled a soft coup attempt led by the intelligence community. And that is predicated upon deceiving all of us on both sides of the political spectrum, or multiple sides, however many there are. And, and it is this handful of supposed elite people in this shadow government, led as it is by the intelligence community working with the Justice Department or members in the Justice Department, that is the immediate practical danger, because what they threaten to undermine are the legitimate claims to representative government in the United States. Not just the slow, insidious, insidious erosion of principle, but the immediate confrontation with authority. So, so I won't attribute what they are doing to the rot in academia, but I would conceive of the rot in academia as too willing to support what they're mm -hmm. doing because it aligns with academia's biases. So the resistance movement is not going to perceive the threat to liberty through the attempted soft coup because it happens to support the resistance movement's biases. What about the rise of the so-called alt-right? Is that attributable to what's happening in uh, American education today? Uh, only indirectly. It, it is attributable, uh, I say this because this is something else, of course, that was predicted a long time ago. Uh, in fact, I once gave a talk at the Hastings Law School 
must have been 30 years ago now, in which I predicted precisely this phenomenon, and I don't mean to be boasting of my prophetic ability, but I can't help but return to things that have been commonly discussed. And on that occasion at the Hastings Law School, I said, look, it is obvious that the demands being made of young people on university campuses today, that they subscribe to a certain commitment to, it wasn't even called diversity yet, but let's just use that word because it's current, certain commitment to diversity, is being hypocritically subscribed by many people. And they're saying, they're mouthing the words in the classroom and papers to get the credential, and they're going back to the dormitories and saying exactly the opposite. They don't believe it. And what you're doing is building up patterned resentment to the conformity that is demanded that will eventually congeal into an expression of an alternative view. And so then the alt-right finally emerges in a point at which people no longer feel under the pressure to conform. It is no surprise. It is a direct result of identity politics being imposed upon people, people being silenced in their freedom of expression, particularly on university campuses, and through the official policies of our governments. Because you can't have this wide-scale practice of preferences based on group identity without forcing the groups who are therefore indirectly identified as excluded, discovering their status as excluded, and expressing resentment about it. And that's all that we're seeing in the alt-right as far as I'm concerned. So we really have to think again about our current notions of civil rights and what they mean. Yes. And I guess we have to think about them now once more in a universal term, applying to individuals rather than to groups. Precisely. Precisely. We, we have fed the beast, and we won't get rid of the beast unless we starve it. And we starve it by speaking of universal rights that we enjoy as citizens, not rights that we enjoy as members of different groups. It's very straightforward. What about the extraordinary phenomenon of Donald Trump and his election to the presidency? Well, Where does that fit in, in terms of the direction in which our uh, political culture is It's the greatest going? finger in the eye mm -hmm. that a political system has ever suffered in human history, as far as I'm concerned. Where, where you have an established order apparently operating on all cylinders, moving along smoothly, and suddenly out of nowhere somebody stands up and says, Stop! <laughs> I'm going to stick my little finger or put a stick through the spokes of the wheel of this bicycle because I don't like what it's doing mm -hmm. to me. And, and this is, could not be more manifest. Uh, eventually, analysis caught up with what was obvious on election night, as I believed. And that was the people whose hopes were shattered when they voted for Barack Obama were sufficiently, uh, su sufficiently alienated by the experience that they turned around and voted for Donald Trump. And that was the basis for the outcome of the election. It wasn't because he brought out the alt-right or new voters. The people who elected Donald Trump were the people who voted for Barack Obama thinking, finally, we will have resolution of our social crises. Finally, we will get reconciliation. We will get our Mandela moment. This is it. That's why, particularly in those Midwestern states, they voted for Barack Obama. And these are the people whose dreams were shattered by Barack Obama and they therefore voted for Donald Trump. And so I think the Trump phenomenon is an expression of the failure of what came before more than it is an expression of the positive agenda that Donald Trump presented to the public. Do you think most other Republican candidates would have received the same benefit of the vote? I think there still would have been a reaction to Obama. I don't know if it would have been as pronounced for the simple reason that most of the other candidates, with one or two exceptions potentially, most of the others would have offended people by crawling under the shadow of Obama rather than directly confronting him. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's too early to say how Donald Trump is going to be remembered as a president, but since you've mentioned mm -hmm. our last president so many times, how do you think he'll be remembered? If he continues on the path he's on, he'll be remembered as having made a remarkable contribution. He's already made a remarkable contribution simply by giving the opportunity for the public, the ordinary citizen, to reject the claims of the elite. That, that's a defining moment. Are you thinking of Obama here or Trump? Trump. No, I was asking about Obama. Oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood you. I thought you said because I mentioned no. him. Oh, how will Obama, I think Obama will be remembered as a great failure. 
I, I don't think there's any doubt about this. He's, he's a man who's obviously whose self perception is extraordinarily high, but you know, he he's a man who won the Nobel Prize for doing nothing, and it turns out in the end he earned it. <laughs> well, maybe we will end on that note. <laughs>